Welcome back everyone to the CSE database seminar. It's a pleasure to have with us here, Professor Karsten Binnig. He's a full professor in the computer science department at the TU Darmstadt in Germany and an adjunct associate professor at Brown. And uh, he is uh, doing a lot of exciting stuff at this intersection of MLAI and database systems, but in the other direction than what I've worked on. So he is building new classes of database systems that use machine learning and AI methods so he's going to share with us some of that stuff that he's been calling Learn DBMS Components 2.0. His expertise spans database systems, data management systems on modern hardware as well, as well as on machine learning for systems. His work has been a recipient of multiple Best Paper and Best Demo awards, and he has received a Google Faculty Award as well. So Karsten, we are excited to hear from you about what you think is the future of ML for DBMSs. Yeah. Hi, Arun, and thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here. As I said, it, I would have loved to be physically here, but um, nah, this time it has to be virtual from my end. Yeah, um, so um, today I'm speaking about a direction, as Arun already mentioned, which I call Learn DBMS Components 2.0, and what this means, I will go over this in my talk. But before I start, let me quickly say uh, all the work and results I'm presenting today are uh, can, act, or I should attribute them to my uh, various PhD students I'm working with, and here are the main students who are behind the work that I'm showing today. And therefore, yeah, the credit or most of the credits goes to goes to them. Before I now start, actually, also maybe one advertisement block. Um, I'm kind of uh, uh, just to also to introduce myself. I'm from TU Darmstadt. Uh, I'm heading there the Data and AI Systems Lab. And recently, uh, Scholt Istvan, who was a uh, former ETH and then Copenhagen, and now is also TU Darmstadt, we now form the systems group at TU Darmstadt. So we kind of cover uh, the database and AI system side, and on the other side, more the infrastructure aspects like distributed network systems. And uh, we are kind of excited about this new endeavor uh, and hope to have some also some uh, more interesting results, which are based on this uh, collaboration in, in the future. So now let me go to uh, what this talk is about. Um, to bring everybody on the same page, um, let me quickly iterate what learned DBMS components are. So the main idea of learned DBMS components is that classical components, such as a database index, is being replaced by a machine learning model. And uh, we might uh, ask the question, so why, why does this all make sense? And let me give you a few reasons why this makes sense. So first of all, what it allows you is to go from hand engineered components that need a lot of manual effort, if you think about uh, of an index, but also maybe other components such as an optimizer, uh, even skilled engineering teams typically spend many years of effort in developing a highly efficient index structure for a given setting. And when this changed, you had to need to redevelop. And what learned components as give us in, in the terms of software development is go from this hand engineered specialized components to automate it learned components. So we can kind of reduce this high manual engineering effort, effort that I just mentioned. And on the other side, many papers have shown that by going from hand engineered components to learned components, we can even improve the performance of the database management system components by orders of magnitude. And the reason there is that in hand engineered components, you still make a lot of assumptions. For example, the optimizer makes assumptions about independence of columns which is in real data often not true. And therefore, learned components can better capture these more complex effects in data, but also the interplay of these, uh, let's say, complex data distributions with queries more accurately, and thus typically come up with, if you think of optimizer, maybe better plans. And uh, another direct, uh, let's say, aspect why learned components are interesting is that, so in the recent years, if you look into Sigmod and VLB, um, and uh, you look into what database components have been replaced by machine learning models, you can see that many of the core database components, there have been already, there has been work on replacing them by ML models. So you cannot just replace an index, but there has been work on how to learn query operators such as joins or sorting. There have been uh, papers on query scheduling, query optimization. And if you go through the database stack, you can pick a component and you are likely to find a paper in Sigmund or VLB on this topic. So learned approaches have been used successfully for a large, large spectrum of DBMS components. So you might now say, okay, sounds wonderful. Um, uh, Carsten, why are you giving a talk today? And what is Learn Database Components 2.0 about? And therefore, let me set the stage 
how the state of the art of uh, learned DBMS components works today, which we uh, analogically would call uh, learning or learned components 1.0. And the predominant approach for the current state of the art of learned DBMS components is what we call workload driven learning. And how this works to understand this, let me give you a quick example uh, of uh, how we could, for example, learn a component in a database system that learns to predict the runtime of a SQL query, which is a core task, for example, in database optimizers, which is called query costing. And, uh, Workload driven learning works in the following way. So typically you first need to collect a training data set and for learning query runtime prediction that involves to run um, several training queries over a given database, meaning a set of tables with rows, so with their data. Uh, then you need to observe the behavior of these queries. Um, if you wanna do query runtime prediction, it would be the runtime of queries. And once you've collected your training data, you can use this to train uh, your favorite machine learning model. And after training, um, if you want to deploy the, the, uh, the model in, at runtime in a database system, so for inference, you would use the model for new queries. So you would take a query, featureize it, feed it into the model, uh, and then do runtime prediction over the very same database. So uh, the assumption is that the data doesn't change, uh, but uh, the model has kind of learned to do uh, query runtime prediction on this one database. And from what I just said, you might already see, um, yeah, uh, while this is an interesting direction, uh, it also has uh, several downsides uh, that uh, render this approach highly unattractive in practice. And uh, let me go walk, walk you over the, the major issues that I see with workload driven learning. So the first uh, reason or downside is that uh, uh, workload driven learning requires typically uh, high effort for training data collection. So Recent papers, for example, on query optimizers, but also cost learning cost models have shown that 10 to 100,000 of training queries are needed. So you need to run this huge body of SQL queries over your favorite database uh, to collect the training data. So in the previous example, the, the, uh, the, query, uh, the query execution and, and the run times. And just running this enormous workload might take hours, days, or even longer, depending on your database size, right? So you need to, to run it on the database where you want to make the predictions on. And uh, even worse, this is not a one-time effort, uh, effort because training data collection needs to be repeated uh, for every new database. If you get a new set of tables, so if you move from your, let's say, finance database to your movies database with very, so very different tables and very different data distributions, you need to run the training data collection again. Or even if in one database, the database is updated and thus the data characteristics change, you would also need to rerun the training data collection. And if you go even further, if you think about, you need to do this for every component, you kind of see that this uh, training effort kind of explodes by the number of training databases and components you wanna learn. And therefore the vision of learned DBMS components, uh, uh, and uh, where also a part of my lab is working on is a question, how can we avoid this high and repeated cost of uh, training data collection and can, can we build models that have much lower effort when a new component uh, should be implemented with ML model or if a new database should be supported. So a new set of tables uh, with new data characteristics. Carson, can I ask a question? Yes. So it, what you presented, so here, so the assumption is the data distribution is fixed, right? So the assumption is data distribution is fixed. We don't have dynamic data. And But the model that you learn, in what sense it has to generalize? Is so it supposed to generalize to any the space of all possible, for instance, SQL query? So even that is not possible with today's models. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I didn't go there into detail, but let me first, so uh, maybe ask, answer your question. So yeah, so there are some, so how basically the current approaches work is, and you'll see later on also why, uh, uh, is that they assume that uh, you have one database that isn't, uh, that where the data distribution is not changing. So you don't have any inserts and updates in your database, basically. Um, it's even not the data distribution, it's, it's even that the data stays fixed because they kind of learn, and I, as I said, I come later to that, if a table named authors is uh, joined with a table I see. books, then the runtime is five seconds. They don't learn, let's say, generalized, based on generalizable features to do query runtime. 
question. Is it fair to say that they're just memoys, the input output mapping that you give them to them? It's just yeah. a memoys. Uh, uh, let's say a fancy way of memoizing runtimes. Yeah. Correct. And this is what the state of the art um, uh, in, in learn database comp components has been doing. There's a recent movement um, uh, where I think where our line of work kind of contributed or was kind of also given some initial ideas on how you could do better. And this is what I want to talk about in, in the rest of the talk. Hope that sounds good. Awesome. Answered. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, we're in the same page. Good. Okay. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to present in the talk is um, our vision on Learn Database Components 2.0, and this is composed out of two directions. And I will also kind of try to motivate why we uh, why we've been working in two, let's say, not different but two comp directions that complement each other. So the first direction is what I call data-driven learning, and for machine learning people that might sound strange. Every learning is data-driven, but from a database perspective, the idea is here that you learn uh, a model, so such as the ones we've shown before, only from data, so only from your database, the tables uh, filled with data, with tuples, so uh, that you have, without running any queries, so without any, running any ver workload. And the idea is here that many of the database tasks that should be learned or could be learned actually only require information about data characteristics, and thus the, the whole workload execution is not required. But clearly, as, you, as I, the implication is that since we only look at data distributions, it's limited to tasks that only uh, require data characteristics and that don't require any information about workload. So for example, tasks like cardinality estimation um, uh, or indexing would be candidates that can be, uh, let's say, targeted with data-driven learning. And I'm showing you a concrete example uh, in, the, in, in the talk. So I'm going here a bit deeper in the rest of the talk. The second direction uh, that complements this line of work is zero-shot learning for databases. And here the idea is uh, that we uh, um, learn a pre-trained model that can generalize to a new database out of the box. So new database, again, means here a new set of tables with uh, different data characteristics. And th that is maybe motivated by the whole trend that you see in machine learning of having large pre-trained models that learn across a wide spectrum of different data sets. So we do the same thing across different databases with different tables. You learn one model, let's say optimizer, and when a new unseen database comes around, you can use this one pre-trained model on the unseen database out of the box without any effort. And I'm going into details also on this approach, but generally, so what the idea why we have these two approaches, uh, so zero-shot learning and data-driven learning, is that for zero-shot learning, this has much broader applicability to different database tasks. So it can do tasks that data-driven learning cannot support. For example, uh, with zero-shot learning, you can do tasks such as physical cost estimation, which is part of query optimization. You can do uh, design tuning of databases. So design tuning is a problem where you, for example, want to know what is the best set of indexes for a given workload. And uh, so zero-shot learning in, in a nutshell supports all types of tasks where the workload is actually important or to know, where it's important to know the characteristics of the workload. And these approaches actually don't um, stand completely orthogonal to each other. It's more like data-driven learning informs zero-shot learning in a way. And I'll, I'll show that later how, how this is happening. So this is just a very high level view. I'm, I haven't gone into any details on how this works, but I will walk you through both parts uh, with a few of the examples on how uh, the individual, uh, uh, let's say, learning methods work for concrete database problems. So let me start with data-driven learning. So the main idea of data-driven learning, uh, as I said it before, is instead of learning from a workload, we simply learn a model that learns the multivariate data distribution over complex relational databases means that we learn data distributions across attributes in tables and across attributes that are stored in different tables. So we have data distributions within a table that we learn and data, ta table, uh, data distributions across tables. So the main idea is that we take a database, sample from that a rep representative set of rows from each table, and then can immediately start learning a model that can be used for various different tasks. And clearly, this has um, uh, uh, um, various interesting, um, let's say, benefits. 
since we only have data characteristics that we learn, we can use it, uh, this one model uh, for various different tasks, as I, as I show below. Uh, so it's only the data distribution. So you need to formulate the task as a way how, the, to query to use the model. And uh, we, for example, in one paper, we show that we can use the same task for cardinality estimation and query answering. Um, and um, maybe some other benefits that I'll come to uh, and explain later is in addition to uh, the benefit that there is no need to execute any training workload, uh, we have shown in, in our papers that um, updating these models is fast, um, uh, in particular the way how we design them. Um, uh, and as I said before, the uh, model itself can support multiple tasks by uh, simply training one model. So you learn one, one model, uh, model once and then can support multiple tasks on the same learned model. So Sorry, this is, Costa. Yeah. One question. So when you say you learn a multivariate data distribution, is it just, for instance, doing something similar to density estimation, but in the context of relational data, finding yeah. a mathematical model for the joint distribution? It's like yeah. learning, I see. Yeah. So do you learn so, a generative model for the relational data? Is that what you're doing? Uh, um, so it's, um, uh, so the concrete, I'm come to the model architecture that we learn and it's, uh, um, uh, not direct, so it's not directly a, 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 a generative model. It's a class of model called probabilistic circuits. Uh, so th that learn probability distributions uh, over. Can the, you over sample the from it? Can you sample from it? Yes. So in that sense, so it's is, generative. So yeah. A, yeah, it's generative. It's, generative because, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not deep generative model, maybe. Yeah, it's a generative a model. Yeah. Generative. Got yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Um, so let me now maybe go uh, a bit more on the concrete side, how such a model work, works by looking at a concrete problem. And let's now look at cardinality estimation problem, which is a classical database problem in query optimization, which can be solved by data driven models. And here, uh, let me maybe quickly walk over what cardinality estimation is in databases. So here, uh, given, uh, you see a given query, which joins three tables, customers, orders, and uh, order line, and uh, um, which also has several filters on the different uh, tables. And uh, the question of cardinality estimation is bound uh, to finding a good query plan. And a query plan that you see below is, for example, here defining the order in how the joins are being executed. And cardinality estimation is used to decide which join order is optimal. And what that means, let me quickly show that. So the uh, idea is that uh, you kind of, uh, for the different join orders that are possible, you estimate the cardinalities to come up with a rough cost estimate for that plan. So for example, for this join order, you would uh, in, uh, est what, what you wanna do is you would like to estimate the intermediate result of the first join and the total result of the end result. And uh, so a simple cost model would be just to sum up these intermediate cardinalities. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, for another join order, if you think about the second join order that is possible, the first join orders and order line, and then customers, uh, you would see that the cardinalities, the intermediate cardinalities are much smaller. And thus this plan is actually the one that you would prefer because here in total, you would only have 11 million as intermediate results if you sum them up uh, compared to the 15 millions before. And the task of cardinality estimation is to come up with these intermediate cardinalities without executing the query. So you'll want to know the intermediate result sizes uh, using a cost or cardinality estimation model. And the, for this task, typically simple models have been used that have been shown to be very, uh, or that can be typically uh, uh, rather way off uh, for different, if, especially if data distributions get more complex. And therefore, um, uh, recent work uh, that used workload driven learning, so this paradigm that I mentioned at the beginning has used deep neural networks to predict cardinalities. And there was a famous paper from Andreas Kipf uh, where they proposed an initial approach on this, where they actually follow the pattern that I mentioned before. They run uh, 10,000 queries, collect their query plans actually, so in which order uh, the tables are joined and uh, report the intermediate cardinalities and use this training set uh, as input to their model. So they observe different join orders, the intermediate result sizes, feed this uh, training time into the model, and then use it for cardinality prediction. 
and uh, they have shown that they significantly can outperform in terms of accuracy classical techniques such as histograms. However, as I said before, this comes with the downsides of workload-driven learning. With data-driven learning, uh, uh, the idea is to learn a model without executing the query, and this is what we've done with DeepDB. And the main idea here is that you learn a cardinality estimation model from simply from the data you have, so from the tables at hand and their references. And for this, we've been proposing um, a new class of models called relational sum product networks that build on the idea of some product networks, uh, which are probabilistic circuits, as I mentioned before. So some product networks are not our invention, but what we've done, we've uh, adopted them for relational databases. And the main idea here is that these models learn the data distributions within and across tables, as I mentioned before. So they are targeted uh, that they can learn from multiple tables, which the initial is, uh, SPNs cannot do. Sorry, somehow my cursor was too far. My, my animation was too fast. Um, so what is the model or what, do, what is the idea when we learn relational sum product networks? The idea is that we, for a given database, we not only learn one of these models, but we actually learn an ensemble of these RSPNs. What this means, you can see this on the right-hand side. So if you would have a database with, uh, say, uh, these four tables that you see on the right side, so order, store, order line customers, and the foreign key primary key relationships between these tables, we could split up this uh, larger database into smaller uh, subsets of tables, whereas for each of the subsets, we would train an individual RSPN that can then be combined later on for example, to do also cardinality estimations for queries that, for example, combine three tables that are not represented by one RSPN. And uh, as I said before, RSPNs are updatable. I'm not showing this in the slides today, but uh, they would support direct updates. So you can, if you have such a model, you can directly ingest inserts and updates into it without the need to retrain uh, it. The, I have some backup slides if this is of interest. Sorry, again, I have a question here. So yeah. why do you learn three RSPN here? So I'm confused about that part. How did you compare? Why did you learn one on customer and order, but only one on order line? I'll come to that uh, also later. So in general- um, We do some sort um, of clustering here? Yeah, so the idea is, um, so I think I, I'll answer the question later okay. on, but uh, the, uh, the, the basic notion is that we split the independent parts of the schema from each other. So we do some correlation tests. And if you see, let's say order line is independent from order and customer, we would learn separate RSPNs. But it also has a, another reason. And uh, this I come to that uh, because otherwise, in a naive formulation, we would otherwise need either a very large RSPN for the full database, which is harder to learn, or we need one per join path, uh, and this is would explode in the number of models we would need. Uh, but I'm, yeah, I'm Got coming it. to Thank that you. afterwards. As I said before, um, even if we have an ensemble of RSPNs, we can combine them later on to support uh, cardinality estimations. Um, for example, if a join query needs to join order line orders in store, uh, which actually requires three RSPNs, we can still combine them in a way that cardinality estimation is possible. And I'm covering the details of all, all of it, the intuition of all this in, in the next few slides. So to understand how uh, RSPNs work, let me start with a very simple example that we want to learn uh, RSPN for a single table, so a database consisting only of, a, of one table, and even here just a table with two attributes. And the basic idea is that we learn uh, the structure of the data by recursively creating so-called row and column clusters. And at the end, um, what we, what we, I, what I show you, what we learn is how to put, why, why do we build these row and column clusters is, uh, so the idea is that we learn on individual pieces of the data that are independent, we learn uh, individual histograms, but only if, um, if, if uh, parts of the data are independent. Now let me walk through uh, the idea about of what RSPNs actually do. So take the database table on the left hand side, which is a customer table with age and region, and it has so data from uh, European and Asian customers, for example. 
The first step in RSPN is that you try to find different row clusters with similar data that could be the older, let's say, European and the younger uh, Asian, for example, customers. And the idea is here that uh, data with similar characteristics, similar correlations is grouped together uh, by using even some uh, simple clustering scheme, such as, uh, uh, for example, k-means clustering, which uh, the original RSPNs have, for example, also used. So we cluster by rows and come up with, for example, two row clusters here with different sizes. And then within each row cluster, because we assume correlations in these clusters are similar, we test which columns in this row cluster are independent. For example, in this simple schema, we would test whether age and region are independent. And if they are independent, we would split them up into two separate uh, column clusters. So in this, this example, this sim simple example, assume we, we, we find out they are independent. So we would split them up into the two column clusters. And since we are now at the most fine uh, granularity we could have, we have in each column cluster only one column, we would uh, 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 extract the histograms for each column and row cluster uh, 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 independently. So for example, uh, this uh, uh, part of the row cluster, uh, which represents the region, would be represented by this histogram. But these models are, are more complex. It's not only that you have just always two layers, but you do multiple levels and iterations of row and column clustering. And uh, if you would do, let's say, one row cluster and you would not find any independent columns in your, in your, in your row cluster, you would further split this row cluster up into smaller row clusters until you find independent columns. So in a way that uh, that way we learn in the row cluster which parts are independent, then split further up maybe by next uh, by another smaller row cluster, and then test again if you find more independent columns. So in a way, this can be seen as an intelligent way of learning a multidimensional histogram without making the trivial assumptions assumption. Uh, uh, that uh, you need to keep maybe track of all columns, but at the end we try to split them up into m many independent pieces. Person, a quick question. Yeah, it seems like the objective of this process is to get the most losslessly compressed representation of the table yes. using some sort of statistics. Yeah. Is it so? The question is: Are there storage constraints on this? Are there size constraints on this? Because if you arbitrarily keep partitioning everything, at the end of the day, each cell can be a leaf. Right. Yeah. So it, if you arbitrarily uh, partition, then it has the size. Uh, it's bound by the number of rows you have. Right. At the end, you would, would have uh, as many as many leaves as you would have rows. If you just if if your independence test always fails, uh, that, that is kind of the maximum model size. But um, so for um, for SPNs, one hyperparameter is the um, minimum row cluster size uh, that needs to be set. So uh, typically, you set this to even at, at, at the orders of 100,000 tuples, uh, or even depending on what, what data characteristics you have. But this is a hyperparameter of the model that needs to be tuned. OK, so it has to be tuned on the data set based yeah. on distributions in the data set. Got it. Yeah. But the goal, I think, it's not just a compact representation. It also, I think it also supports certain, uh, certain inference tasks sufficiently, right? Yeah, that's so what I come to. Tractable. Okay. Yeah. One more question. How do you extend this to how do you extend this to relational data? Okay, we come to that. And how do you okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's in a, in a few slides. Uh, yeah. So how, how would you use that for uh, at inference for, for cardinality estimation? So for example, if you want to find out uh, which customers are from Europe and younger than 30, you could query the tree structure uh, in each leaf. You uh, could query the histogram uh, to find out the likelihood that some customer is from Europe uh, or that uh, the customer is younger than 30. And then um, you kind of see why we added uh, sum and product nodes. The product nodes are there to multiply uh, the likelihoods and the, the summation node would just add them up. So at the end, this, for example, for this query, we find out that 5% of the customers come from Europe and are younger than, than 30. And this, uh, uh, so result, you can use this for cardinality estimation by simply multiplying this with the size of the table. Good. Um, maybe just the intuition, you can maybe also see why this is updatable. Maybe so a new, if you insert, for example, a tuple, you need to traverse the index structure and update your leaf distribution. Um, the only uh, careful, we need to be careful if data distributions or data correlations change, but we've shown that actually, uh, even with, with data shifts, that such a structure is still highly, uh, highly accurate. 
Um, yeah. So now coming to Babak's question. So how can we support a relational database with multiple tables? And uh, the naive approach here would be that we simply learn one model per join path. So one model per single table, one for every a combination of two tables uh, uh, as well as three tables on. So we would materialize the result of this join and learn one SPN on every uh, materialized output of a join. But clearly this is um, uh, uh, maybe a, a approach that works, but um, this uh, would clearly grow uh, with the number of tables, the number of models would grow exponentially. That means that this approach, the naive approach, doesn't scale to really large schemata. And therefore, what we've uh, what we've what we've what we've done uh, is we've extended SPNs by something uh, we call tuple factors, and I come to that in a minute. What that is, um, but in a way, what it allows what uh, what these tuple factors allow us is um, to combine or project an RSPN uh, down to a set of tables that is used by the query or even combine it across several RSP, uh, several RSPN across tables. So to make this a bit more clear, uh, what are the two cases that are actually important here? Uh, the first case is um, now assume we have three tables, two RSPNs. One is learned across the materialized join of customers and orders, and one is learned on the order line table. And the query only needs a part of the first uh, RSPN, namely it only uh, wants to do cardinality estimation for a query that queries the customer table. For this, we use these tuple factors, and I'm showing you in a minute how this works. In a second case, which is important, where we also need these tuple factors actually to combine several RSPNs. So here we have the same situation before, the same two RSPNs, but the query this time uh, is across orders and the order line table which are represented by two different RSPNs and combining them can also be done by tuple factors. Now, what are tuple factors? Let me explain this maybe by the case one, because here it's kind of uh, more intuitive uh, to, to understand. So the example for case one, where we only want to know the uh, number of or European uh, customers based on a RSPN that was learned on the materialized output of customers and orders. And here is maybe down here, you see this uh, um, materialized output. If you just look at the black rows here, um, so this is the materialized output of the join. So in between these red bars, and you see um, so that in, in this model, you would have maybe if a customer has multiple orders, the same customer appears multiple times. And what the tuple factors uh, actually represent, so this F prime here is, uh, so the replication factor uh, from the primary key table, meaning that here uh, the replication factor for the customer one is two, therefore the tuple factor is two uh, for customer two, it's one because uh, the customer one appears only one time and customer two appears again two times. So these tuple factors uh, kind of represent how often uh, the same customer, the same tuple is replicated in the data set due to the join. And this information, uh, so we materialize these tuple factors before we learn the model, and then we learn the model uh, and use, so look at this as just another, uh, let's say, column of the database that we learn in addition uh, with the other columns. And what this gives us is that we can do cardinality estimation um, on, this, uh, on this model, with, which has also learned tuple factors in the following way. So first of all, uh, we would, uh, uh, we need for the cardinality estimation clearly again the sign of the uh, of the materialized join table or better it's the size of the materialized outer join i'm not going into details why it's an outer join but simply assume now it's a join uh, we do the same computation as i've shown you before we do the expected fraction of tuples uh, of customers which are from europe which we get from the rspn we, we get we trained on this uh, on, uh, on this larger table here uh, and then we need to reduce uh, this output by the typical join blow up. So meaning the, the replication factor uh, for, the, for, the, for the attributes we look at. And for our case, this means uh, the table size would be five. The expe uh, expectation, expected fraction of tuples that, uh, for customers that come from Europe is uh, three over five. And uh, the, the normalization factor from the tuple factors 
uh, so the typical the average you can think of this as you need to normalize by the average orders of European customers uh, is is shown here. And if you just uh, add or multiply these together, uh, you get the the expected output for um, for a, a query that only needs a subset of the tables here. And if you now think if you want to do this across tables, you can do the same apply the same ideas across tables. So if you have tuple factors, let's say from orders to order lines, you can do this even to combine uh, di different models across tables. So use a similar idea. Quick, quick question, yeah. Carson, sorry. Yeah. Just to make uh, sure they understand. Yeah. Is the idea here is, okay, so I'm going to learn uh, this RSPN on the combination of the uh, join of order and customer. And then you have a trick essentially to infer in a sense, RSPN now for each of them, right? Yeah, yeah. that's this yeah. is this is the trick to do the yeah. to essentially marginalize in a sense, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. That's it. Yeah, and this is by having these additional tuple factors that we pre-compute, and they are learned together with a in the model with the other attributes. Is it lossless in the sense that you can recover the RSPN on each of the base uh, the base relations? Yeah, lossless. Lossless in uh, in in the uh, sense that you can recover the RSPN in. So we in don't either. recover the RSPN. We use the, the 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 full RSPN that we learned on this uh, 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 on the joint output, and we use it in a way as I've shown you on the right hand side. So we uh, we only normalize the result. It's not sure. that we kind of. You use it for inference, but if you yeah. want to recover the RSPN, is it possible? Yeah. I haven't thought about it. Uh, should uh, because should you're, do, be you're doing a, it in an should, indirect way yeah you're doing should, it in an indirect way I think. yeah okay. should should be possible but uh <laughs> i uh, don't nail me down on that uh, before i have thought properly about it uh, okay awesome. so good okay um, yeah, let me come maybe to um, the results we uh, presented in the initial paper, uh, so the DeepDB paper, where we compared DeepDB uh, on a benchmark called JobLight, which is the join order benchmark, which uh, uses the IMDB database, so a real world database. And we compared it at that in our paper against uh, MSCN, which is the approach from Andreas Kipf and several non-learned approaches. And maybe let me just quickly go over the results uh, so here we report an error metric called Q error, uh, which is the relative error that the cardinality estimation makes. So meaning one would be perfect cardinalities and two means that the cardinalities uh, uh, are factor two off. And here we see the med median Q error, uh, as well as uh, the percentiles, as well as the max error compared to the other, let's say, estimation techniques. And you see, um, so in, in by the results here that we are uh, even compared to workload driven models, uh, we can uh, we can provide higher accuracy and the models are sem themselves still of size of typically only a few kilobytes or sometimes megabytes, but this is still uh, we think tolerable for for large databases. And uh, yeah, here I don't want to go too much in details. It's a generalization experiment since we don't uh, we are not bound by that we need to see three, four, five phase joins in advance, so we simply learn the model. On a data set, uh, uh, we can generalize to larger joint joins and also more selection predicates. So the first number here stands for the number of joins, the second for the number of filter predicates in a query. And you see that while we kind of provide uh, uh, some, let's say, lower, lower error, uh, uh, Q errors here in the, uh, if the queries become more complex, you would, you see that workload driven models uh, the error is increasing. In particular, I think for this experiment, we trained the MCSN model only for up to four-way joins, and still tried it on five and six-way joins. And the error is uh, getting more complex, uh, more is, is getting higher for these larger queries. What is nice is that uh, since we published the code, and you see the link to GitHub up here, it, uh, and it was one of the first papers that uh, didn't need any workload for cardinality estimation. It has been reproduced by now by more than 20 follow-up papers that used our code also on various other data sets, not only IMDB, but various other real-world data sets. And while they typically still report a, few, a bit of gain over our approach, 
it, our approach still shows the same robust performance across all these data sets that have been reported in, in several papers. So I think this is a nice result showing that our, our, our approach uh, um, uh, is not only working on the database we use in our experiments and a reward also as a researcher if somebody else is using your code. So one um, question, do you know about the efficiency and the efficiency of these some product uh, that, uh, circuits for uh, when the data becomes sparse? How do they perform when the data is very sparse? Mm. Uh, so we don't have, we, have, we haven't looked into, into their performance of sparse data. So we mean if, uh, if, if, if certain, there's a, yeah, if there's if a the lot of- If the query is very selective, if yeah. the query is very selective, no, if the query uh, is very selective, so, how do they perform in terms of prediction? So we, uh, uh, in the original paper, we also have uh, experiments on different selectivities. Um, so usually um, uh, it de depends also then a bit about uh, on your, uh, let's say um, um, we had, we talked, so we, we discussed before the, that there are hyperparameters uh, uh, on, on, uh, that you can set for the model. So if you really go for, uh, have queries that, uh, let's say uh, take a, a column with, uh, let's say, many distinct values and uh, execute a, a cardinality, uh, a quality predicate on them. Um, you need, uh, and uh, 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 and uh, also maybe they have the, uh, the models typically get less accurate with a number of, uh, with a higher number of, of distinct values. So uh, that is analogous to your question. So if the selectivity yes. is, 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 is uh, selectivity gives you only a few, a few rows, uh, then these models typically typically suffer. But uh, um, so, as I said, this is also kind of a way how the model should be tuned and built. If you know that you have many of these um, uh, low selective uh, queries, um, then uh, uh, it's maybe better to have a bit more fine-grained resolution in the model. So maybe also the, the clustering should be more fine-grained of, of the data that you that you use in when, when learning the model. But nonetheless, like learning this high dimensional uh, distributions is difficult and learning more yeah, of these yeah, high dimensional yeah, physics yeah, is difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, I'm not going details, but um, uh, let me wrap up for the first part. So uh, data driven learning, we've shown that this idea can be used for many other database tasks, not just cardinality estimation. Um, I'm just leave uh, it maybe there and, uh, and uh, then move forward. But as I said before, data-driven learning is not a silver bullet for all possible tasks. In particular, if you want to learn a model that replaces the database component that needs inherently to know uh, the characteristics of the workload. So for example, if you do query runtime prediction uh, or the, uh, let's say, want to predict contention of different updates, you need to know a bit the characteristics of, of the workload. And therefore, uh, we've been working on this second direction, um, uh, which we call zero-shot learning for databases, uh, where uh, we use a, 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 an idea of pre-trained models, where the pre-trained model is uh, seeing, let's say, the behavior of workloads across several databases, and then uh, is trained uh, in the pre-training phase and can be used out of the box for new unseen database. So we really want to use this model without any fine tuning, but clearly it can also be fine tuned uh, on an unseen database. So let me maybe also here walk you through how zero shot learning works with a small example. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I can cover all the things I have in my slides, but I at least like to come to the main intuition here. Um, so the tasks that we are looking at uh, um, and to understand how zero shot learning works is the runtime prediction task that I mentioned at the beginning. And let me now zoom into this runtime prediction task a bit more in detail. So what this task typically takes is given uh, uh, for a query, you typically the first thing in an optimizer do is to come up with a plan. And runtime prediction is operating on the level of plan. So the input to runtime prediction is a, is a plan and you want to know how fast is this plan executing. You can use this, uh, let's say, task of runtime prediction for many different database components. So for example, the task of cost estimation is a foundation for query optimization. You could select a plan that has, or we want to select a plan which has minimal runtime. So we would all enumerate different plans and ask the model, what is the runtime for this over the other plan? 
Um, but you can also use it for other tasks such as query scheduling and DBMS advisors, um, uh, which try to find an optimal set of indexes for a workload. So here the question is also, given a workload, uh, which set of indexes would uh, potentially minimize the runtime of queries if these indexes would be existing? So far, this task of runtime prediction has been tackled again with simple heuristic-based cost models that are often inaccurate or by workload-driven learning, which, however, has the high training overheads, as I already mentioned before. So the question is now, how do we do that with zero-shot models? And the main idea, so the comic overview slide for this is that uh, what we do is we have several pre-trained databases, so that different databases with different tables and data characteristics, and we run a workload on each of them. So we would report different query plans uh, and their runtime uh, on these uh, on these databases and use these plans and their runtime on the diff different database to pre-train, for example, our zero-shot cost model. Once the zero-shot cost model is pre-trained, we can use it on an unseen database again. Uh, so we would input a plan to the model, and the model would give us a, a, a runtime estimate. The question is now, what is, uh, what is the core idea to enable such zero-shot cost model that can generalize across databases? And you might now ask the question uh, that ties also a bit uh, back to the discussion at the beginning is, why can't we just, for example, use workload-driven models that I shown at the beginning that kind of take plans as input and, uh, and, uh, uh, and learn the runtime prediction one database? Why can't we simply train this model on multiple databases and simply achieve a zero-shot model by running the training phase across databases? And uh, to answer this, que uh, so, uh, this question, why this is not possible, let's look in into uh, how these models uh, typically, uh, how they encode queries, which is a reason why they don't, let's say, why, why they can't generalize across models. So workload-driven models, in a nutshell, can only learn from a single database, so from one uh, database. And the reason lies in the fact how they encode the query attributes or the attributes of this database and also tables uh, that, that, that are present in the table uh, in, in, in this database. So the main idea how they encode uh, 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 information of, 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 of different database in query plans is shown here on the slide for two different databases. So for movies and a customer database. Now let's look just at the, at the left hand side, the movies database. So if you want to, uh, uh, for example, express that uh, you have a query that selects the movie rating attribute from the movies database, these um, uh, models, uh, the existing workload-driven models use one hot encoding that simply uh, enumerate over the different attributes. So one zero means that, uh, or re would represent uh, the movie ratings attribute and zero one, the movie runtime attribute. And if the query contains, let's say, uh, the movie rating attribute, you would use it as part of your query encoding that you feed into the model. So the model learns kinds of, as you said before, it memorizes if movie rating is there, I would see a certain, let's say, runtime behavior uh, of, of, of that query versus maybe querying another, another query attribute. So, um, and here is also then now maybe it becomes clear if you simply apply um, this encoding on different databases, um, uh, you would see that the same attribute, uh, that, that different attributes are encoded by the same vectors, by the same encoding, despite they have very different data characteristics. Uh, and therefore, if you also think of maybe other encoding schemes where you say, okay, every attribute should be represented by a different, let's say, a flag in the uh, position in the vector. So if you have two databases, you simply use, in each having two attributes, you simply use a vector of four uh, to represent the attributes of the different uh, databases, but then the model can still not generalize. Um, but now assume we have this encoding, and if you simply train one model across databases, the model would rather suffer because it sees maybe different runtime predictions for different attributes with very different data characteristics, and thus the overall model, uh, let's say, quality will suffer. And from this, you also see that there's, if using such an encoding, such a representation of queries, there's no simple fix to workload-driven models. So you need to rethink how you featureize and represent queries and data to make them actually generalizable across uh, across data sets. And this is what we've done with zero-shot models. So uh, the main contribution here is that we encode queries and data very differently from state-of-the-art. 
So instead of coding and coding attributes or table names, we encode, encode something we called, uh, uh, we use so, something that we call transfer, transferable encoding. And to understand what the uh, main idea of transferable encoding is, let me again look at a query that here um, executes, for example, a summation over the line order table. And this query would be represented, first of all, you would encode the query plan information uh, with a graph uh, of operators, um, as well as the data uh, would also be represented as part of the graph. So here, for example, we show that we execute a query with, which does a sequential scan over uh, a table, which versus, uh, and then do an aggregate on top, which uses an aggregation function uh, uh, of over one column of the table. So it's uh, the graph represents kind of the query plan and uh, the data we query. And the important part here is that uh, each node, uh, uh, we annotate each node with transferable features. So for example, the table node is represented not by its table name, but, uh, but using information such as the tuple width, so the row width in byte, uh, but also the number of rows in this table. And columns would be represented by type information rather than, for example, attribute names. And by this, you can see that uh, the model kind of learns, for example, based on certain table sizes instead of table names, it would learn what the runtime of certain query operators on, on, on a table with certain data characteristics is. So once we've encoded uh, a query in a way uh, uh, that I've shown on the left-hand side, we feed this graph representation into a, a graph neural network based encoder where each uh, node is represented also by a graph node in the graph neural network model and learn by this graph GNN encoder um, uh, uh, latent representation of the query and data uh, that was represented by this graph. So kind of this representation learns the runtime or represents, you can think of this, this represents the runtime comp complexity of the query plan uh, on, on uh, a set of tables using these transferable features. And since these features learn something, the dependency between, or represent the dependency between runtime and uh, for example, table sizes, the, uh, this representation should also work across uh, databases. And this is what we show also later on in the experiment. So once you have such a representation um, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that is just a vector, we have another uh, decoder, which is a simple multilayer percept perceptron, which learns a regression task, which takes this representation and predicts the query runtime. And I just have a few slides um, on how other queries would be encoded. Uh, maybe I think the general idea is clear. Um, so here, this is a join uh, query with two tables. Uh, and uh, if the, and we would do the very same uh, procedure, as I mentioned before, we encode the complete query tree, uh, use a graph-based encoder. Actually, we, uh, we simply do a bottom-up pass on the query tree. So it's a special or a particular um, let's say um, a, a version of a graph, uh, graph neural network encoder that uses a single pass learning scheme. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so here we would learn again a vector that represents this join query and then do query runtime prediction. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, let me maybe um, um, move forward. So what, what the, 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 uh, this uh, representation here learns, uh, the intuition is, uh, that it learns kind of in the latent space different representations. So one dot stands here for one query plan across, for, on one database with certain table characteristics. And in this space, it learns to kind of predict based on the, uh, the representation, this latent space, what the query runtime is. So you can think of that. It learns, so it organizes this latent space by com query complexity. So with, with larger tables, they should be in a different part of the space. Or if you have maybe queries that have more joins, they should be also represent in different parts of the latent space. So um, maybe to conclude, um, is this all working? Um, uh, um, so here, the main experiment from the paper um, where we trained a zero-shot model on 19 real-world databases uh, that we collected from a repository called relational fit. So in total, it was 20. So we trained the model on 19 of them. and we did the uh, query cost estimation on the 20th database that the model has not seen. And whenever you see here a database on the X axis, uh, then this is the 20th database the model has not seen. So we repeated this experiment for uh, every database and used the other 19th for training, uh, for the training data collection and pre-training phase. 
And here again, we see the Q error. So one is the kind of the best Q error you could achieve. And you see that uh, uh, the zero shot model, uh, again, so can generalize to all the different databases by using the other databases as pre-trained databases. Um, while, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, here, we compare the cost estimates to a cost estimate that Postgres would give us, um, which can also do kind of out of the box cost estimation on, on different databases. But you see that the Q error of uh, the Postgres uh, uh, cost model are much higher than, than our model that can work out of the box. We also have experiments where we show, um, uh, so how does this compare to workload driven models, but because of time, I don't wanna go uh, into them. So if you have questions, I can, we can go over the slides. Um, and maybe to wrap up, uh, um, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, maybe two more words. So we've, we've shown that, uh, so zero shot models, cost models cannot be only used in databases, but uh, so in a recent depth papers, we've uh, shown that uh, this idea of zero shot models can also be used on other data processing systems. So here we use it on data streaming systems. And um, in general, in my lab, we also work <coughs> on other directions um, uh, that are based on pre-trained models. So we have a recent paper on a, a TRL workshop at NeurIPS where we use pre-trained models on relational data sets uh, to construct something that we call a foundation model for relational databases. So the idea is here that we have one pre-trained model that can be used for many different downstream data engineering tasks. Um, but sorry that I needed to rush at the end, uh, 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 but uh, I still hope that it, uh, let's say the, the end was somehow clear. Um, and I'm happy to take now, uh, surely a lot of, uh, the, if, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them. Okay. Thank you, Karsten. That was a comprehensive overview. I think the zero shot transfer learning stuff is very fascinating and looks promising. There's a lot of generalizable structure for query plans that can be reused across optimizers and systems. Yeah. Very cool. And the TRL workshop is at Neurips, right? Is it? Yeah, yeah. Next month. It's in the beginning of December, yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, cool. That sounds exciting. That's the first time it's I'm hearing about it. Yeah, it's Madelon um, uh, 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 she uh, She's behind uh, the Git uh, tables corpus, for example. Um, she is organizing it together with Laurel Orr <coughs> and um, I'm not sure who else is involved in, in, the, in the TRL workshop. But it's so it's a nice venue because if you look now at who's actually there, it's, it's actually a nice mix of database uh, people working on uh, table representation learning as well as machine learning <clears> people. <throat> so it, it, I, I'm looking already forward to this workshop uh, because it's now uh, yeah, it's bridging the communities, which is sounds fun. Uh, yep, that's yeah. another bridge. Okay, so let's give Carsten a round of applause. Let's see if we can clap over here, but you can also put it on the reactions. <laughs> More questions from the audience. A good question maybe from me. Yeah, go for it. I also found the idea of learning this uh, sort of domain independent representation quite fascinating. So it was it was interesting. So can you show the the graph that you have GNN on it for represent you use that you show you use GNN for representation? Like I have a quick question about using GNN. Yeah. So yeah. the yeah. first yeah. question yeah. is whether you use any sort of other encoders in graph representation learning uh, other than GNN, maybe simpler forms of representation learning other than GNN. So the specific question is, GNRs are, GNNRs, GNNs are good for picking up certain graph structures that are otherwise cannot be picked up by other represent, graph representation learning methods, right? Have you tried to see whether there are actually some information that you see them in the structure of the query plan? That um, could be useful for the downstream analysis, whatever you're doing. Does that does the question make sense? Um, uh, so uh, maybe let me repeat it, and then you can um, okay. just uh, uh, try to try to try to refine what I. So uh, your question was if so. I'm not hundred percent sure if I if I got the intention of the query question. So is it uh, so if you tried out also other encoders uh, and not uh, gra so graph neural network based ones or uh, yeah, it's, it's graph network is just one way, one way to do 
uh, representation yeah. 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 to yeah. encode sure. the yeah. graph, project yeah. the graph in the latent space, not just the only one. Yeah. I assume you use message passing graph neural networks. Yeah. yeah. So but we... the yeah. Okay. Uh, if the, if the goal okay, so message passing message passing graph neural networks not only pick up the local information around the particular node, but they also pick up the global information. Yeah. Because they are message passing, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's, they pick up certain graph topology information as yeah. well. Yeah. My question is whether whether uh, there are some information that are actually hidden in the graph structure that is useful for <clears throat> this particular task. Have you tried to yeah. use other sort of graph representation that are less expressive than GNNs, random box, for instance? Yeah, um, let me let me maybe uh, go over, I, I glimpsed over the learning scheme. So we don't use a full-fledged uh, multi-round multi, so multi message passing scheme. So what oh, we I are see. doing here is, um, <clears throat> so uh, because of the nature of uh, the problem, we have a query tree, right, and we use uh, here, a bottom-up pass where we do message passing in one, so in in a bottom-up uh, way from child nodes to to uh, to the to the parent nodes, which means uh, that uh, the hidden state is uh, then passed to the final to the root node where we get uh, the final embedding of the complete query plan. So uh, in that sense, it's already a simplification of I see. Uh, of of so what graph neural networks typically do. But we, we we also played around with full fledged message passing, but we we found at least for the for the task we had for query runtime prediction um, uh, that didn't make any difference. Uh, so it was that, rather that was like, exactly that was yeah. exactly my question. Yeah. So yeah. whether there is sort of global information that could be used. So you essentially learn a representation for the root node, right? Yeah, it's not uh, for since, since we do message passing from bottom up. It's it oh, uh, yes. the root node representation. Uh, captures the information of, of the complete query tree. But the representations for the nodes on the right-hand side and the left-hand side are completely independent. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they are uh, independent, but would feed into, uh, into the, uh, so message passing is done bottom up. So uh, sure. the, root the, node. the root node uh, still contains yeah. from both branches, the information. information. Interesting. But the query plan is a graph; it's not a tree, is it? Uh, the query plan, uh, it's so it can it's a DAG, right? So uh, uh, it always goes from source nodes uh, up to the to the root nodes. So you can represent query plans as a as a DAG. So it's not a tree; it's a directed acyclic graph, and therefore we still kind of you can topo topologically sort it and do message passing in in this single pass method scheme that we're using. I see. Oh. I'm just trying to see whether we, we really need GNNs here. Maybe a simple yeah. sort of projection, very simple projection, maybe give us the set sort of uh, information. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's maybe still something that, so the database community or where we need to look into. Uh, so there has been recently also work on uh, query plan, so representation learning, where they, mm -hmm. uh, if, Let's say the other extreme is they linear, linearize the query plan in a certain traversal order and feed everything into a. That's what I had in mind. In, into a transformer, so. Um, oh, they they feed it the yeah. transformer. They treat it yeah. as a bag of words. So they, uh, yeah, this is. Uh, is it really needed? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, some some claim. Uh, so, because sometimes it's kind of you want to learn effects from longer chain. For example, if you have a certain combination. Mm -hmm of operators that you have a hash join over a six, so over a table versus while some other operations can be happening in between you want to have the possibility to learn that uh, 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 so um, that different parts of the query plan influence the runtime in a different way um, and uh, and therefore maybe not only the structural information is important but uh, you want to learn, capture these effects as well uh, but yeah so the goal the from the theoretical perspective, the goal would be to essentially learn similar representations for queries that are semantically equivalent but potentially have different query plans, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That in, that's what we that's, need. So in, in a sense that, uh, so query plans that have the same runtime complexity should result in the same representation. That's not necessary, right? Because even these models work across databases. They might yeah. be totally different databases, but their structure might be the same. And but are the, the input, the input, uh, the statistics of the tables are inputs of the representation. 
Yes. So it's so supposed to capture that too. So they don't need to be equivalent queries or even semantically related queries. They just need to match on these represented features. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay, so it seems like there's a lot of <laughs> work that needs to be done here in understanding the representation. What are doing? That's why that workshop is pretty exciting. So thanks. <laughs> I, so, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think we are. I agree that there's work work to be done. But um, so we are we are kind of um, yeah getting there uh, uh, step by step in a in a way. I think the the representations we are uni using are you can think of them. They are much closer to what a, a classical optimizer would also learn, right? So what it would do is based on these basic data characteristics uh, to estimate costs uh, at the end. Um, and but what we do is we can capture more of the side effects and I haven't shown our complete featureization because it's not only these simple features, but you also want to capture so, for example, um, uh, how different. Uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, data distributions and correlation influence the runtime and therefore. Uh, uh, yeah, we also annotate certain data characteristics along the plan, but uh, I didn't want to go into details here. Um, uh, because that would then take a bit. Yeah, would have taken a few minutes longer. No worries. You can take a look at the paper. Thank you again, Karsten. And thank you again to the audience. I will, um, this was very educational. We learned a lot of new things. Thank you so much, Karsten. It was amazing. Great talk. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I will stop the recording here.